We are engaged in a rather brief study of the incidents in the life of David that have significance for us today. I say a rather brief one. I really don't know how long we will be going on this topic. But uh, there are many wonderful illustrations of spiritual truth in David's life. I think as I reflect upon the relationship of David and Saul, the thing that comes most to my mind is the great prospects and potential that apparently Saul had which were unrealized. He was, in one sense, the brooding hamlet of the Bible. In Hosea chapter 13 and verse 11, the prophet, looking back over the past history of Israel, now speaking the words of God, says, I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. Because you remember that the idea of a king was not really something that originated with the Lord God, a human king, but rather originated with the people. And consequently, the whole line of the monarchy was something that had its origin in the people rather than in God. So far as Scripture is concerned, it would have been much better had Israel said, we already have a king. Our king is the Lord God in heaven, and we look only to him. But the remainder of the Old Testament, and it's remarkable in that King David, of course, is one of the leading anticipations of the Lord Jesus, is the story of the monarchy which finds its ultimate co consummation in the Lord Jesus Christ, a monarchy that it would have been even better for Israel never to have had in the form in which they had it. Well, we looked at the opening verses of chapter 16 of 1 Samuel last Sunday, and we are looking now at the remaining verses of the chapter. And for our scripture reading, we're reading verse 14 through verse 23 of chapter 16. And the author of the book writes, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. That Hebrew word is a word that has the idea of falling upon someone, and falling upon someone with a view to terrorizing him. Saul's servants then said to him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God is terrorizing you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you, let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you that he shall play the harp with his hand, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me now a man who can play well, and bring him to me. Then one of the young men answered and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and a handsome man, and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send, send me your son David, who is with the flock. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a jug of wine and a young goat and sent them to Saul by David his son. It was, of course, the custom not to come to the king without some kind of gift like this on a mission such as this. And so this represents Jesse's expression of appreciation for the king. Then David came to Saul and attended him, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor-bearer. 
And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David now stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. So it came about that whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand. And Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. We, of course, know that this may have worked for a while, but it did not work permanently, as further history indicates. May the Lord bless this reading of his word, and let's bow together in a moment of prayer. Father, we are grateful to thee that on this day, the Lord's day, we are able to gather in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, David's greater son and the eternal king, the messianic king who shall rule and reign in the kingdom of God. We thank thee that he sits at the right hand of the throne of God, having completed the work upon which his eternal kingdom is founded. And we thank Thee for the confidence that we have that all of the plans and purposes of our eternal God shall be accomplished. And Father, today we praise Thee and thank Thee for the hopes that we personally have by virtue of what Jesus Christ has done. We thank Thee for the counsel that the Lord God in heaven gives us through the Holy Spirit. And we thank Thee for the fact that we look forward to Thy presence and pleasures forevermore. We thank Thee for the day to come when we shall awake in Thy likeness. We thank Thee for the promises of the Word of God that so plainly tell us that the time is coming when we shall have resurrection bodies like the glorious body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as we reflect on all that Thou hast done in the past and on into the infinite future, today, Lord, we exalt Thy name. We acknowledge that we are creatures redeemed by the blood of Christ. We stand upon no other ground than that which He has accomplished. And we praise Thee and thank Thee for the hope that Thou hast given to us. We pray for the whole church of Jesus Christ today. May, as the church has met or is meeting or will meet, the name of Christ be exalted and the fruit of the ministry of the Word of God be of eternal significance. We pray for this assembly of believers. We ask thy blessing upon Believer's Chapel, upon the individuals who are in this meeting and in the meetings that follow. We pray thy blessing upon them. We ask especially for our Sunday school and for the children and the young people and the adults as the Word of God is taught. May there be response to it. And then, Lord, we especially remember those who are sick or unable to be with us, who have serious maladies and need the ministry of our great God in heaven. Father, minister to both body and spirit and glorify thy name in the lives of the saints. We pray for each one, a believer's chapel who is ill or sick or bereaved or hospitalized. We pray for each one of them and for their families and for the physicians who minister to them. And Father, for those who've requested our prayers from other places, we pray also for them. We bring them before Thee. We ask, Lord, that Thou wilt accomplish Thy perfect will in their lives. And we are confident that Thou dost hear our petitions. We ask now Thy blessing upon our meeting. May our Lord be exalted. May we be built up in our faith. And through this week, we pray that we may be better representatives of him who loved us and has loosed us from our sins by his own precious blood. We pray in his name. Amen.
The subject for today as we continue our study in David's life is the tragic fruit of disobedience. We raise also the question today of the relation of music to mental disturbances and of sin to spiritual and moral mor madness. In your study of mythology, you may have remembered the stories that surround Orpheus. Orpheus was someone who could play so beautifully that the wild beasts would be soothed, the trees would dance, and the rivers would stand still. He was on the boat, the Argonaut, the Argonaut with, jo with Jason, when uh, they passed the island in which the sirens lived. And uh, if you studied ancient mythology, you'll remember the, sil the sirens were interested in, by their beautiful music, so enchanting the sailors who passed by that they would be drawn to the rocky isle, would strike the rocks, and then would go down in drowning. Well, Orpheus was on the boat, and as they passed by, the sirens were singing, but Orpheus, in order to counteract, chanted loud praises and songs to his god in order to get by and successfully managed to get by. The lesson, of course, being that the pleasures and the enjoyments of life are temptations for us and that the thing by which we may be delivered from them is the worship and praise of the true God. Milton was delighted in music too. He once made reference to that, saying he delighted in such musical service as may with sweetness through mine ear dissolve me into ecstasies and bring all heaven before mine eyes. One of the interesting things in the Bible is the response that Elisha made when the three kings came to him and asked him to pray for them as they were going to make an, an onslaught against the Edomites. And the king of Israel and the king of Judah and the king of Edom asked him for counsel. He said, were it not for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah among them, he wouldn't even make any petition for them at all. But because Jehoshaphat was there, the king of Judah, he said he would make a petition for them, and he called for a minstrel. And as the minstrel played upon his heart, God's word came to him. It's a very interesting experience that the scriptures relate about Elisha. Well, in a moment, we will have something that will be something of an answer from the word of God for it. King Saul was a man after the flesh. And he was king of a nation that had developed the same mind, the mind of the flesh. King Saul is the response to the desire of Israel for a king, like the nations. That little phrase is so important, give us a king like the nations. They wanted to be like the world. And so because their desire was so strong and they would not have anything but something like that, Scripture tells us that God in His wrath and anger gave them just such a king. As Hosea put it years later, in my anger I gave them a king, I took him away in my wrath. So desirous for a king, God ultimately permitted them to have a king. He gave them their request to put it in the words of the psalmist, but he sent leanness into their souls. There's a great principle there, and in the lives of you and me, the same principle holds. We may persist in our disobedience, in our desire for that which is second best, to the extent that God will give us that, but He will also send leanness into our souls. 
And that, of course, is what happened in the case of King Saul. He was man's king. And being man's king, he was ultimately rejected. David was God's king, selected by God, chosen by God to be the king of Israel as Saul failed. Now he has been anointed by Samuel and is eventually to replace him. Now after David's anointing, we read in the 14th verse of chapter 16, now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. There are probably some years between verse 13 and verse 14. There are some problems of chronology. And unfortunately, we do not know the precise chronology, and it's impossible for us to assuredly answer the questions that come to our minds. But there does seem to be a period of time between verses 13 and 14 in which David goes back to Bethlehem he serves his father Jesse with the flock, and also there is evidence that he attended Samuel's school of the prophets, and there he was taught by the great prophet in the things of the Lord, and perhaps even also taught how to use his harp or his lyre, as his harp was, in the service of the Lord. Because after all, in Israel, in the things that had to do with their worship, there was place for that. And David had an important part in the organization of the ministry in music, as is evident from the book of Chronicles. It's likely that during this period of time, David wrote such psalms as the eighth psalm, in which he looked at the heavens and then reflected upon how little man was in the light of the glory of God in the heavens. He probably wrote, most students of David believe, Psalm 19. Heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. And then in the latter part of that great psalm, he writes about the word of God and the benefits of the word of God to man. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, as he reflected upon his occupation under God out on the hills of Judea, the chances are that it was at that time that he reflected most fully on the parallel between his work as a shepherd and God's work as the great shepherd of Israel. And then perhaps also Psalm 29, in which the things of nature are particularly set forth. At any rate, this was David's preparation time. And he had grown from a tender youth after this to a very robust manhood, as we shall see. The 14th verse in the New American Standard Bible that I'm reading begins, Now the Spirit of God departed from Saul. The authorized version in this case I think is perhaps a little bit better in its rendering, the Hebrew uh, term may be rendered either way. It's a simple little conjunctive particle, and it can be rendered now, it can be rendered but. I like the rendering but. But, you see David's been anointed, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Now, it's an interesting thing that Scripture speaks in this way. I think occasionally we tend to think this is something that was adapted simply to the strange ideas of people who lived at that time, and we're not to take this too seriously. An evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. The modern reader, with false views of God's nature, as if being so securely and fully a God of love that this could never happen, tends to stumble over this and to think there must be some explanation that would water down what appears to be the plain teaching that the evil spirit that terrorized Saul came from the Lord. 
But actually, that's what the Scriptures say. And an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Now, of course, if we in our minds and with our hearts read the Word of God and seek to be subject to it, then, of course, we would have no difficulty with this. But unfortunately, most of us are very strongly impressed by the things about us, and consequently it's difficult for us in our society to take the Word of God and just take the Word of God as it stands written. Job, speaking, I think, at least in principle to the point, writes, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In other words, it's true, as the Scripture says, that the evil spirit may come from the Lord. And in this instance, that's precisely what the Word of God says. Isaiah goes into great lengths, as well as Amos, to tell us that that's precisely within the sovereign determination of the Lord God. And if you're interested, read Isaiah chapter 45, verses 6 and 7. We do not have time to look at them. So the evil spirit had come from the Lord, and it was disciplinary judgment upon King Saul, and it terrorized him. I suggested in the Scripture reading that the Hebrew verb that is used here is one that means to fall upon, essentially, translated sometimes that way, to fall upon. The Revised Standard Version, I think, catches the mood of it, tormented him. Intense mental agony in such, to such a degree that his reason at times would give way to temporary insanity. Saul is the Hamlet of the Old Testament, and he is an individual who has discord in his inner life. Hypochondria was that under which or from which Saul suffered. The Hebrews spoke about that as bad air, because the word for spirit is a word that frequently means simply air, and the word for evil is a word that means bad. And so consequently, the evil spirit could be rendered bad air. And so bad air is the way they looked at it because they also looked at Satan as being the ruling power of the air, as the Apostle Paul does in Ephesians chapter 6. The air about us is air, is air that is filled, according to Scripture, with the demons and the evil spirits of Satan. So consequently, bad air. We will just call it hypochondria. He was a person who felt that he was uh, troubled and tormented because of uh, his own, as it goes on to say, because of his own personal experience. Now we read in verses 15 through 18, after this description of the departure of the Holy Spirit from Saul and the coming of the evil spirit of the divine providence in David's preparation. Saul, you see, had lost Samuel's support. And disturbed also by his own failures, he needed help. In fact, that's precisely what one of the more recent commentators has said about Saul at this point, Saul needed help. And so the text goes on to speak about the help that is to come to him. One of his servants says, let our Lord now command your servants who are before you, let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall come about when the evil spirit, when the bad air from God is upon you, that he shall play the harp with his hand, and you will be well. A skillful player with the harp. The lyre, the ancient portable tranquilizer, they would like for it to be. In other words, the equivalent of Valium was the harp. It would give some temporary relief to King Saul. Now, this is not something unusual, that is, not something that is related simply to biblical things. 
Pythagoras comments about the use of the harp in calming the spirit. And in fact, many others have spoken about it as well. In ancient times, it was believed that uh, the harp would have some salutary effect if it were played. Not simply the harp, but any particular music. Even Luther writes about it, for he found inspiration and courage in the same kind of way. He said, next to theology, I give the first place and the greatest honor to music. Milton, as I mentioned, I think, delighted in such musical service as may with sweetness through mine ear dissolve me into ecstasies and bring all heaven before my eyes. Now, the harp was, however, something that was both negative and superficial. It could not give the positive. It might give some benefits, but it could not give the positive that was needed because Scripture tells us that the healing of the Spirit is something that comes from the grace of God and the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So any benefits that come from the harp are negative and superficial. The proof of that is the fact that later on, while David is playing his harp, Saul is so little under the influence of it that on two occasions he throws his spear at his harpist and seeks to kill him. So I'm sure that David afterwards may have said it helped him for a while, but it certainly didn't help him today. And if it wasn't for the fact that he was able to escape the spear, he would have been a dead harpist. Music is no curative of spiritual ills. Most of us who are Christians are very thankful for music. We are thankful for the music in which the marvelous grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is expressed. And I confess that it has great significance for me. I love to listen to good Christian music. I like to sim, sing the good Christian hymns of which there are a few in our hymn book, but not too many, in my opinion. I just happen to like certain kinds of Christian music, and most of the things that I like have some age and aging upon them. They minister in theology to my spirit, but it is no curative. We've seen that recently in Roseanne Barr's singing. <laughs> it really didn't help those people in San Diego or wherever she was very much. And as a matter of fact, after she got out a few notes, they began to boo. And uh, they've been booing since. And in spite of what a young lady writing for the New York Times, which repeated, I noticed also in the Dallas paper, what she did at that particular, on that particular occasion was not, in my opinion, high art. Music is no curative. And the thing that one must remember after all of this is that Saul's illness had come after confrontation with Samuel over his disobedience. In other words, the thing that brought Samuel to his condition was not some inherent thing that was wrong with his constitution. What had brought Saul to his place was disobedience. He had disobeyed in three specific things according to 1 Samuel. He had, for example, not slain Agag, as God told him plainly to do. He had sought, for example, to kill his own son, Jonathan, and was finally prevented from doing that. He had, contrary to Samuel's wishes, he had offered a sacrifice, not waiting for Samuel to come and offer it as he intended to do. 
And so Saul's life is a life of disobedience. And the disobedience is the thing that brought him to his state of being the Hamlet of the Old Testament, a person who was troubled by his inner feelings, the, play, the thing that made him a psychological disaster was disobedience to the Word of God. So, we're not surprised then that Saul is in the state that he's in, and Scripture says, let's command your servants who are before you, let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you. And I'd like for you to notice something here. We read in verse 14 that an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. But in verse 16, we read an evil spirit from God is on you. Now, I just like to think that there is probably some significance in that. An evil spirit from Yahweh has come upon you, the writer of this book says. But then the individuals who are asking about someone to help Saul, they put it, an evil spirit from God. It's almost as if they are individuals who take the attitude of the common man. This could not be something that comes from God, for he's a God of love. And so they use the general term that is applicable to all of the peoples who speak of a God. But the striking thing to me is that the author of this book says that this evil spirit is a spirit that comes from the Lord. In other words, from the covenant God. It's almost, I say, as if the individual who speaks to Saul is an individual who's unwilling to ascribe the action to Yahweh, their covenant deity. And so he just says an evil spirit from God, as if to make it more general. No, no. The author says the evil spirit comes from the Lord the God that we know, the covenant-keeping God that we worship, the one who exercises mercy and loving kindness toward us. He's the one who is responsible for this. I wish it were possible for us to go back to some of the places in the Old Testament to support this idea and to undergird it. But at any rate, they say an evil spirit from God. And... He shall play the harp with his hand, and you will be well. And so Saul, of course, responds affirmatively and uh, provide, asks, provide for me now, or commands, provide for me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the young men answered and said, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who is a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and a handsome man, and the Lord is with him. That's a very interesting statement made about David at this time. The hand of God in this development does not need any emphasis, surely. The fact that this individual knew something about David, and the fact that Saul needed someone like this, and the fact that Saul and his problems and this individual who knew about David should come together at this particular point is simply an evidence of the sovereign direction of God in the lives of both Saul and David. When we read the Word of God, we should never forget that we are reading the Word that has to do with a providential God who orders the affairs of life according to His will. And so this individual speaks up at the proper time and uh, illustrates God's sovereign determination of the affairs of, Dave, of Israel's great king. But notice the description of David. All the keys of the greatest kind of life hang from David's girdle. He's royal. He's talented. He's courageous. He is a fighter. He's wise in his speech, prudent in his speech. This past week, I was reading in my favorite time of relaxation, the funny papers, and there's an interesting 
little section that I read every morning, if I possibly can, called Sports Hall of Shame. In 1972, there was a game in which the Baltimore Orioles, managed by Earl Weaver, where he was upset over a decision, and so he began to argue with the umpire. Now, those of you who remember Earl Weaver will remember that he was a very feisty manager, a very successful one, and he liked to argue, and he was thrown out of quite a few games. Well, they were arguing this time over a seldom call rule that went against his team. And so, I know the rules as well as you do, Weaver declared, and I've got a book in the clubhouse to prove it. And the umpire said, uh, I've got the book with me now. And Earl replied snortingly, that's no good because I can't read Braille. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, he was ejected from the game. Uh, one of the things I like about David here is that we read that he's a skillful player on the harp. He is a musician. He's a mighty man of valor. He's a warrior, but he's one prudent in speech. And on top of it all, he's a handsome man. And most of all, we read, the Lord is with him. It's a puzzle to read that he's a man of war at this time because he hasn't yet fought so far as we know, with uh, Goliath. But it's possible that one of the young men had been occupied with David in some of the battles with the Philistines that were incidental. And it's possible that he with him had been involved in such a way that he had seen that David was truly a man of war or at least had the potential and he was willing to praise him to that extent. They had perhaps gone out on some little worked together and had defeated some Philistine wrestlers. And he has now become a man, and he speaks of him in this way. But most significantly, David was a man with whom the Lord was. He speaks of himself as the servant of God. He speaks of God as his rock. He speaks of God as his redeemer. He talks of God as his shepherd. He speaks of the Lord as the host in the house of his life. He speaks of him in, as his comforter in every place, in the caves and on the hills of Judea. And he, in weariness, found the Lord to be green pastures for him. In thirst, he found him to be the waters that refreshed his spirit. God's Word he writes about in Psalm 19 as being perfect and right and pure and restoring the soul, rejoicing the heart, enlightening the eyes, and better than honey, better than honey that dripped from the rock. He says he set the Lord always before him in Psalm 16 because he was at his right hand and he could not be moved and therefore his heart was glad. It's no wonder that we read in Scripture the Lord was with him. The affairs of David's life were affairs in which the Lord was always before him. All of the experiences of life were looked at in the light of the Lord is with him. I have set the Lord always before me. Let me say to you, my Christian friend, and I speak to myself as well as to you, I don't want to lecture you, but I do believe that if you will put the Lord before you constantly, as David did, look at the experiences of your life, if you are a believer in Christ, in the light of that great fact, and you will not need any other counselor than the Lord God. The Scriptures make that so plain. David himself says, I've been reading through David's Psalms. In one of his Psalms he says, the Lord had become his counselor. How marvelous it is to have such a counselor. And looking at the affairs of life in the light of our Lord, as our counselor, as all of these things about which David speaks, is really the solution to our problems. We won't even need any music to charm us if we keep the Lord before us.
We'll find music charming. We'll find music elevating. We'll find music helpful. But the Lord is ultimately our counselor. We read in the last few verses of the coming to court of David. He's faithfully performed the routine of daily duty out on the hills of Judea. He's been a faithful man. Saul incidentally expected obedience. He sent word to Jesse and he said he would like to have David and he expected David to come. Here is a man who expects obedience from all of his subjects but did not comply himself because he was a subject of the Lord God in heaven. And what one sees in the life of Saul as he more and more becomes troubled as a result of his disobedience will ultimately lead to what someone has said is the gathering gloom of Gilboa where he lost his life. Now we read in the last verse or so that David came and whenever the Spirit of God Whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand, and Saul would be refreshed and well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. He came and he attended Saul. He was Saul's armor bearer, preparing him for his court experiences which would come to him later on when he himself became the king. We read that Saul loved him greatly. The charm of David's presence someone has put it, writing like this. He was David the beloved. Wherever he moved, he cast the spell of his personal magnetism. Saul yielded to it and thawed. The servants of the royal household loved him. Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. The soul of Jonathan was knit with his soul. The women of Israel forgot their loyalty to Saul as they sounded the praises of the young hero who was so goodly to look upon. The wild, rough soldiers were willing, willing to risk their lives in order to gratify his wish for a draft from Bethlehem's well. So he passed through life, swaying the scepter of irresistible potency over men and women. The beautiful Abigail, glad to wash the feet of his servants. Achish says that he's an angel of the Lord. Ittai the Gittite clings to him in exile. The people slink into the city because he's weeping over Absalom. All of that because ultimately David is a man who, though failing, set the Lord always before his face. Let me say just a few words in our conclusion. When you think about Saul and you think about his mental disturbance and you look back over the experiences that are set forth in 1 Samuel, there are some, some things I think that we can say about the causes of Saul's problems. First of all, let me say also this, that it is possible for an individual to be disturbed and not disturbed as Saul was. David in the Psalms speaks in that way. He talks about being disturbed. For example, in such Psalms as 42 and others, there are expressions of the psalmist in which there is an expression of disturbance, but the disturbance is set in the light of the word and will of God. In Saul's case, it was different. He had the secret consciousness of sin. He had sinned and he was unable to free himself from his sin. His sin, someone has said, haunts him as a ghost. He will even say such things as, I have sinned, but it's evident that he never really had repented of his sin. So the secret consciousness of his sin troubles his heart. And let me say to you this, that any believing man who has sinned against the Lord God and knows that he has sinned against him knows precisely the troubles that troubled King Saul. Because when we sin, we have the same experience of the troubles of our inner man. There was the knowledge of the loss of a goodly heritage. The songs of Zion, which he may have heard, echoed the long lost potential that Saul had. And when the music came, there was a temporary opportunity for him to turn from his way, but the ministry of the music was only transitory. 
it did not touch the heart of Saul. There was the fear of exposure, and in fact, he asks Samuel later on, saying, I have sinned. Uh, I said later on, actually earlier, but later on after his sin, I have sinned, but please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. But that he never did. Fearing exposure, but not repenting. And the secret persistence in wrongdoing that characterized his life. If you can say of anyone he cherished his sin, Saul is a man who cherished his sin. His troubles were alleviated by the music from the heart, harp, on occasion, but they never removed his problems. Sad thing, because my Christian friend, there is no curative other than the blood of Jesus Christ and the right relationship of the sinner to him. Music is very lovely, and very lovely for those who are in the will of God and who are rightly related to him and make it possible for us to enjoy in a truly significant way the things that have to do with spiritual life. But music is abysmally impossible as a curative of our problems. Unfortunately, many people run to music and other things in order to gain something that is pleasing to them to cover up what their fundamental need is, the right relationship to the Lord God. In other words, the excellent gift of music may be perverted. When I think of that, I think of Amos. And Amos, in chapter 6 and verse 5 of his book, speaks later on of what has happened in the nation of Israel. He says, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and then goes on to speak in this way. Those who recline on beds of ivory and sprawl on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who improvise to the sound of the harp, and like David have composed songs for themselves, who drink wine from sacrificial bowls while they anoint themselves with the finest of oils, yet they have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they will now go into exile at the head of the exile, and the sprawler's banqueting will pass away. Amid the music, amid the banquets, amid the celebrations, all of the things that might have been so glorifying to God if they had been done by individuals who kept the Lord God before them always are now things that God speaks of as being steps along the way to their judgment and punishment. The evil spirit departed for a time from King Saul, but the good spirit never returned. The disease was still there and stayed there until the end. The two Bonars in the 19th century were Scottish Presbyterian ministers who had a wide ministry, both Andrew and Horatius or Horace. One of them wrote these lines which pertain to the 19th century but may be transposed into the 20th century. He wrote like this. It is said that the evil spirit departed, but not the good spirit returned. Saul's trouble was alleviated, but not removed. The disease was still there. The results of David's harp were negative and superficial. He goes on to speak about the fact that our age is full of such appliances, literary and religious, all got up for the purpose of soothing the troubled spirits of men. Excitement, gaiety, balls, theaters, operas, concerts, ecclesiastical music, dresses, performances. What are all these but man's appliances for casting out the evil spirit and healing the soul's hurt without recourse to God's remedy?
there are some th certain things there that reflect the 19th century, and perhaps certain things reflect Mr. Bonar's, whichever one it was, uh, attitudes towards Scripture. But in our day, in which we are so in tune with the age of entertainment of which we are a part, what happens is that the things of the Lord within the inner man suffer as a result of it. I like the story of the healing of the garrison demoniac. And you may remember that legion of demons inherited him. And when the Lord Jesus came, they begged him that he would send them out into the herd of swine. And Jesus did. He sent them out into the herd of swine, and the swine rushed down the slope and into the sea and all drowned. Pork was rather high in those days if you wanted some bacon. But the interesting thing about it to me was that Mark describes what happened as the man who had been possessed of the demons now standing before the Lord God in his right mind. Isn't that interesting? In his right mind. That's what the Lord Jesus does for individuals troubled, disturbed like Saul, disturbed by the experiences of life, and for Christians also, disturbed by the experiences of life, the Lord Jesus is able to bring such a healing and restoration that we stand before him in our right minds. For that, I give thanks to the Lord God. If you're here today and you've never believed in Christ, we invite you to turn to him. If you're here today as a believer and you've been harboring sin and you've been disturbed and upset and wondering about the things that have made your life so disagreeable and such a problem to you, it may be precisely this, that there is persistent sin in your life and that persistent sin has brought divine discipline to you and it will bring divine discipline to you. And the solution according to Holy Scripture, is the repentance and confession of our sin that brings restoration to the saints of God as well as to the sinners who do not know saving grace. May God speak to our hearts from this incident in the life of David and Saul. Let's stand for the benediction. Father, we are grateful to Thee for the ministry of the Word of God, and as we reflect upon King Saul, such a troubled man, who failed to deal with his sin. O oh God, keep us from such an end for ourselves. And for those of us who are believers, and who may be troubled by persistent sin, Lord, Deliver us from the failure to turn to Thee in repentance and faith and in the reception of the restoration that Thou art so freely wishing to give. For Jesus' sake, amen. Mm -hmm.